know it, but Linkin Park were actually one of the biggest bands in the world for the good part of a decade. Since their wildly successful new metal debut, the band's discography has sold more than 100 million copies worldwide. Beginning as a rap metal group in the early 2000s, the band would begin cycling through their own iterations of alternative rock, electronica, metal, and more, leaving old fans behind them with every new transition in sound. The band now remain in a sort of limbo with the tragic loss of their lead vocalist, but appear hopeful in returning to the project in the near future. As someone who moved on from the band after their first couple of releases, I decided to venture through the rest of their catalog to understand what happened to Linkin Park. Before Linkin Park would find success, they would first meet failure. High school friends Mike Shinoda and Brad Delson envisioned creating a band that would defy genre blending their favorite styles of hip-hop, and rock in a way that hadn't been done before. Together with drummer Rob Borden, they would form the band Zero in 1996. In art college, Mike would meet DJ Joseph Hahn and invite him to join Zero, adding a whole new dimension to their sound. Meanwhile, at UCLA, Brad was roommating with the band's eventual bassist, Dave Farrell. And by 1997, the band were recording demos with fellow high school alum, Mark Wakefield, on vocals. Playing small gigs would soon earn them enough attention to open for System of a Down in LA, and scouters at that same show would help land them a development deal with Zamba Music. The band knew they had something special here, and decided to double down on their efforts. But over the next three years, Zero would be rejected by every major and independent label in the business. The band would make the difficult decision of dropping Mark and begin the search for a new vocalist. Zamba's VP of A&R, Jeff Blue, would help the band find Chester Bennington, eventually sending him an instrumental track to record his vocals over. A few days later, Chester was in Hollywood at Zero's rehearsal space, writing with the group. They soon rebranded themselves as Hybrid Theory, and released their self-titled EP in 1999. The band began garnering some serious attention online, after spamming their music in message boards. But trying to capture the attention of record companies continually proved more difficult. Their demos were met with denial every single time. From a label's perspective, Linkin Park weren't creating anything too different from the rest of the new metal explosion of the early 2000s. And signing another band in an already oversaturated genre was risky and redundant. Luckily, the band still had someone who believed in them, Jeff Blue, who was now VP at Warner Bros. Records. He helped sign the band as a developing artist and advised that they change their name yet again, this time to avoid confusion with the electronic group Hybrid. The newly named Linkin Park were finally signed to a major label in 2000, leading to the release of their debut record later that year. Written and recorded in just four weeks, many of the songs were simply rewritten and polished versions of the demos that saw them rejected by virtually every label on numerous occasions. It was a risky move. The genre fusion of metal and hip-hop was nearing its pinnacle in mainstream popularity. But the genre would end up peaking with Linkin Park's hybrid theory. The band were taking the basics of the rap metal fusion and getting rid of the corny personas and profanity that had become associated with the genre. They expanded the sound to include atmospheric electronics, while striking a great balance between angry and vulnerable lyricism. I felt this way before. So The effortless interplay between Chester's throat treading and Mike's rhymes were also pretty refreshing. Simply put, Linkin Park's new metal didn't feel like a gimmick. They were truly passionate about their sound, and created catchy and relatable anthems that quickly connected them to a legion of fans who saw emotional depth in their heavy music. Plus, it carried no parental advisory sticker, which moms and radio stations adored. Hybrid Theory would be the year's best-selling album with nearly 5 million copies sold. To date, the album has been certified diamond and has sold over 30 million copies worldwide. The group set out on an extensive American tour, working on new material in their makeshift tour bus studio and putting together the remix album Reanimation in their downtime. Writing would continue at Mike's home studio following their tour, and once production started, the band were just going for it. As their contemporaries scrambled to evolve and hang on to their fan base, Linkin Park decided to craft more of what had garnered them international success.
Despite the increasingly taboo rap metal formula, Linkin Park fans were hooked and begging for more. Expanding on their debut, Meteor delivered a concise and more refined track list. You have the hybrid like cuts Don't Stay and Hit the Floor. But then complete diversions like Nobody's Listening. A waste of time. An almost entirely hip hop track featuring Japanese bamboo flutes, and Breaking the Habit, an atmospheric ballad featuring a string section and some of the group's best lyricism. Meteora would go on to sell tens of millions of copies, leading to a number of side projects, including a mashup EP with Jay Z. But with how similar Meteora was to Hybrid Theory and Sound, it raised the questions of where Linkin Park would go next, and if there even was a place for their sound to go at all. It was now 2005, and rap metal was dead. After touring in support of Meteora, a following release would be temporarily shelved. Mike Shinoda formed the hip-hop side project Fort Minor, and Chester Bennington started the rock supergroup Dead by Sunrise. For the sake of their artistic integrity, Linkin Park couldn't do the same thing a third time. So, Rick Rubin, the career rebooting producer, began helping the band find a sound they could continue pursuing moving forward. Minutes to Midnight would be their most diverse group of tracks thus far, carrying a more stripped down punk sound, some classic rock flair. <laughs> And fewer hip hop stylings, with Mike only rapping on two songs. Yeah, here we go for the hundred time. Hand grenade pins in every line. Throw them up and let some shine. Going out of my fucking mind. Joe's turntable scratching virtually disappeared, and even their guitarists seemed to have taken a back seat on the project. Linkin Park's third album failed to perform as well as their first two records. I mean, it still sold 20 million copies, and when it came to single power, Minutes to Midnight had plenty of it. What I've Done would be their most commercially successful single, in part because it was used as the main theme of 2007's Transformers. Linkin Park's reinvention would come with the obvious criticisms, that they had sold out and went mainstream. Their audience was one where they either didn't want change or they'd outgrown the band. Regardless, the group had set themselves up for continued relevance in the alternative rock category. And had you held on, Linkin Park was just about to get a hell of a lot more interesting. The band would work with film composer Hans Zimmer to score the second Transformers film, before heading back into the studio with Rick Rubin to wrap up their fourth record, A Thousand Suns. Linkin Park proclaimed that this new record wasn't going to be like any of their previous albums, but rather a cutting edge sound separate from anything they'd done before. And to be honest, they kind of pulled it off. Spoken word samples, synth loops, industrial and house elements, a handful of interludes. A Thousand Suns has been called Linkin Park's Kid A, or their dark side of the moon. He says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Not in technicalities, of course, but in spirit. It's an art rock album, and it works best when it's experienced from start to finish. It's also a concept record, dealing with themes of nuclear war and the end of humanity, regret. Fear, anger, sadness, and even hope are emotions that litter the album. And it all builds towards humanity's last moments before the bombs drop. Waiting for the end to come, wishing I had strength to stay. A Thousand Suns was a good record, just not the good record that diehards wanted from Linkin Park. This was a complete departure from their guitar-heavy work that weaved seamlessly through a number of genres thanks to a handful of interludes. Despite the new direction in sound, the album still sold really well. This was Linkin Park after all. But this was not the old Linkin Park, leaving a lot of early fans to move on. The band would begin producing their fifth record, Living Things, while on tour, eventually inviting Rick Rubin to co-produce with Mike Shinoda for a third time. The band wanted to bring back the energy of their older material for a more overall comprehensive sound. And that description is pretty spot on. Living Things is an electronically charged reboot of Hybrid Theory. It contains the aggressive and moody nature of their first two records. And these promises broken, deep below, each 
some of the balladry from Minutes to Midnight. while leaning further into the electronics of A Thousand Suns. It does have a few fun experiments like the folk-inspired Castle of Glass. Although it's not nearly as ambitious as their previous record, adhering more to one genre and some fairly straightforward songwriting. Re-embracing the rap rock formula, Living Things seems to have been an attempt at wooing back alienated fans. But it's a formula that wears thin towards its second half, as the band begins sounding like a complete parody of themselves. The right energy had returned, but their sound was far from their new metal origins. They soon released a second remix LP in 2013. Then, before heading out on the Living Things World Tour, Mike would start on demos for a follow-up record, sounds that were in line with that of their previous two records, which the band and Ruben felt pretty positive about. But soon after their tour, Mike was appalled by those very same demos, deciding to scrap them entirely and begin again from scratch. For the first time since Meteora, Rick Rubin wouldn't return, and after the producer's departure, the band's electronic sound went along with it. The Hunting Party was yet another reboot, a full return to rock, and the heaviest they've ever sounded. The way Using hybrid theory as a template, Linkin Park wanted to bring their debut into 2014. But this record is much more metal than new metal was. Guitarist Brad Delson and drummer Rob Borden sound like they're a part of the band again, being given a chance to show off their talents with plenty of guitar solos and hammering drums. <laughs> System of a Down and Rage Against the Machine members would join the album too, but you would hardly notice they were even there had they not been credited. And much of the record is like that, unnoticeable and just not very interesting. This would be the band's first record to not reach number one since Hybrid Theory, debuting at number three on the Billboard 200. It still sold a couple million copies, it was Linkin Park, but this was an album the band were meant to be making years ago, and as a result, it just sounds dated. This record sounded more like the Linkin Park old heads would remember, but most of those old heads had already forgotten about Linkin Park. The Hunting Party was Shinoda's response to feeling that the current modern rock landscape was weak and sounded like Disney commercial music. But then they'd go and release one more light. So In the strangest twist of fate, Linkin Park decided to say goodbye to rock altogether. One More Light was a transition towards pop that divided fans more than ever before. Not because it was pop. Linkin Park have arguably always had a pop element to them. One More Light just wasn't very good. The band is nearly unrecognizable. In just one record, Linkin Park went from this... To this. On the bright side, it continued the band's willingness to push the boundaries of their sound, I guess. But seriously, who was Linkin Park making this record for? The early new metal crowd had left sometime after Minutes to Midnight. The electro pop fans would stick around until maybe the hunting party, and when they'd finally taken a step towards hard rock, they went sugary pop the next. Who was going to stick around after this? Fans and just plain music listeners were straight up disappointed, and the band had had it with fans continually asking for more like Hybrid Theory. But just prior to this record, they were using their debut as a blueprint. This massive overhaul just didn't make sense, and felt inauthentic to the band. Two months following the album's release, the world lost Chester Bennington after he had committed suicide at his home in California. With no note and having just gone on vacation with family, it came as a shock to his loved ones, the band, and fans. Understandably, the group would cancel their upcoming world tour and move into a hiatus following a tribute event in honor of Chester. The band has since struggled with the idea of how to move forward with Linkin Park without their lead singer. And more recently, they've revealed that they'd been writing just before the pandemic struck, but that it had been put on hold since. So for now, we wait with patience and curiosity as to where Linkin Park will go next. 
but Chester will live on in the hearts of the millions of fans that still listen to Linkin Park today. For a period of time, Linkin Park were one of the biggest bands in the world. Their first two albums saw them empower a generation, and it appears their following records would continue to do so for some time. Some of us just didn't need them anymore. They're a band that continually evolved their sound, either in an attempt to keep their heads above water or in trying to recapture the glory that came with their debut. A Thousand Suns is definitely a gem I hadn't yet discovered, and I can definitely share in every fan's disappointment after finally listening to One More Light. In the end, it doesn't even matter. Linkin Park have more than solidified themselves in popular culture with a number of stylistic releases that are sure to please, or simply remind you of your childhood angst. I love LCD Sound System. One of my first videos was about James Murphy and the band's journey through music, and I bring this up because Curiosity Stream just uploaded Shut Up and Play the Hits a documentary looking at the last 48 hours of LCD Sound System before their final show at Madison Square Garden. Of course, that disbandment wouldn't last and they'd return over just seven years later, but it's a great personal look behind the scenes of an artist wanting to get out. Use the first link below to start streaming it now. Whatever excites your curiosity can be found on Curiosity Stream. How will humans start terraforming Mars? Check out Becoming Martian. How will we solve the challenges of climate change? Engineering the Future is an entire series on the subject. How did feathers give dinosaurs an evolutionary advantage? Find out in Amazing Dino World. These are just a few of the great documentaries you won't see anywhere else but Curiosity Stream. Plus, you'll also get free access to Nebula, which is the independent streaming platform that me and a bunch of other creators are currently working on. For middle eight viewers, a Curiosity Stream subscription is less than $15 a year. So, this bundle of Curiosity Stream and Nebula is a great package deal. Give it a try and head over to curiositystream.com forward slash middle eight and start streaming some of the internet's best documentaries and creator content right now. If you like the video, show it some love with a like rating, subscribe, and hit that bell so you never miss an episode. Support us on Patreon if you could be so kind, and if you're looking for some new music, listen to my bi-weekly podcast, Playmate, where I interview artists and we chat about music. It's all in the box below. Thanks for watching, and keep listening to Linkin Park.